watch news footage of disasters in the third world, you see people who know what to do. This is a sad time and the people are sad. They weep and they wail and they mourn and this is all entirely appropriate. But if you watch news footage of disasters in the West, what do you see? Not weeping and mourning. Uh, there's one dominant emotion on display. Shock. How could this happen, people are saying. How could this happen here? How could this happen to us? We feel entitled to good health, financial security, national security, job security, any and every kind of safety. And when these rights are threatened or removed, we are completely destabilized. Today, we're going to look at the, dis the disasters that befell Egypt in the Exodus, the plagues of biblical proportions. Let's see what the Lord intended by these plagues. I think we'll see two things in particular. First, we'll see that the plagues were meant to reveal the Lord. And secondly, they were meant to humble Pharaoh. Firstly, to reveal the Lord. The Lord's repeated phrase, as calamity rains down, is, And you will know that I am the Lord your God. Through the plagues, the Lord's name will be made known to the Israelites, to Pharaoh, to all the earth, and to the generations to come. And you might ask, what kind of God is made known through plagues? The answer is, a God who is trying to get through to a deaf people. There's a saying that most people never look up until they're flat on their backs. Uh, this being the case, disasters can be a severe mercy. The original plagues of biblical proportions are just the kinds of wake-up calls to rouse a stubborn king and his evil regime. From blood, to frogs, to gnats, to wild beasts, to pestilence, to boils, to hail, to locusts, to darkness, and then to the death of the firstborn, the plagues become more and more and more deadly. At each point, there is an opportunity for Pharaoh to repent and let the Israelites go. Yet the madness of the human condition is seen in his hard-hearted rejection of the Lord, plunging himself and his land into ruin. The second purpose of the plagues is to humble Pharaoh. According to Genesis chapter 15, verse 13, Egypt had humbled Israel for 400 years. They had afflicted, enslaved, and impoverished them. Uh, Moses, now at the head of this afflicted people, became the most humble man on all the earth. So says Numbers chapter 12, verse 3. Moses is therefore the polar opposite of Pharaoh. Pharaoh is, according to Exodus chapter 9, verse 16, he is one who is raised up before all the earth. But Exodus 10, verse 3, he refuses to humble himself before the Lord. This is what the plagues are for. Moses gets it, Pharaoh doesn't. And it's not just Pharaoh who doesn't get it, though. Uh, in the book of the prophet Amos, a millennium later, plagues befall Israel. And the Lord expresses grief and consternation that the Israelites have not responded with humility and repentance. In, in Amos chapter 4, we see plagues falling on Israel. And the constant refrain is, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Uh, for Instance, uh, Amos chapter 4, verse 10, he says, I sent plagues among you as I did to Egypt. I killed your young men with the sword along with your captured horses. I filled your nostrils with the stench of your camps. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. The Lord expects that plagues should humble us, not harden us. Again, in the New Testament, uh, we see in Revelation chapters 15 and 16, we see plagues falling on the whole earth. And yet those suffering refuse to turn. Revelation chapter 16 verse 9 sums up humanity's common response to these plagues, these calamities. It says, but they refused to repent and glorify God. The plagues on Egypt are foretastes of the judgment that will befall the whole earth. One day there will be a cosmic shakedown, a mighty revelation of the Lord Jesus, a humbling of everything that is lifted up. That is the intention. And yet when calamity strikes, there are many who fail to be humbled. Instead, they are hardened. And that is an immense tragedy. 
Let's remind ourselves of one of the most constant themes in the Bible. It just happens again and again. It could be one of the greatest themes of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. Or Psalm 147, verse 6, the Lord sustains the humble, but he casts the wicked to the ground. Or Psalm 149, verse 4, for the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with victory. Or Zephaniah chapter 2, verse 3, Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. You who do what he commands, seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. In Exodus, the humbling plagues increase until there's only one place of shelter, the blood of the Lamb. All the plagues lead to Passover, and all the judgments of God lead to the cross. The cross, you see, is the ultimate plague. There the Lord's name is revealed and the Lord's people are humbled. Even the judge of all the earth is humbled in the darkness. The question is this, when calamity strikes, will we look all shocked or will we learn from disaster? Nothing is secure in this world except Christ. Nothing is solid except his kingdom. Everything else that can be shaken will be swept away. These judgments are a severe mercy, urging us away from the sinking sand of this world and onto the solid rock of Christ. So what will be our response to suffering? Will we be hardened or humbled? Will we raise ourselves up in indignation or bring ourselves low in meekness? There is one answer to the storms of this life. There is one refuge. Don't perish on the sinking sand of this world. And don't shake your fist at the rain. Come to Christ, our Lamb, our Rock, our Refuge. In the words of Martin Luther's great hymn, A mighty fortress is our God, a tower never failing, our helper he amid the flood of mortal ills prevailing. In the final verse it says this, Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still, his kingdom is forever.